Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord, my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows and by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumbled are armed with, with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry are hungry no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, but she who has had many sons pines away. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. This beautiful prayer opens chapter two of the book of First Samuel. And it's the prayer of a woman named Hannah who had tried many years with her husband to have a child, but they were unable to. And this prayer becomes even more beautiful when you realize that just the chapter before, Hannah was praying desperately to God in anguish and in pain over not being able to have a child. And here she is, one chapter later, singing the Lord's prayer, praise as he answers her prayers. Now, originally, First and Second Samuel were one book, and they're only split in our Bibles today because of the way they fit on the original scrolls. So this prayer not only sets the tone for First Samuel, but it sets the tone for Second Samuel as well. And already we get the big idea of First Samuel. The pride or humility of our hearts will determine whether we are successful on this earth or in the kingdom of God. Immediately, it is very clear that the Lord is close to the humble and lifts them up, but the Lord opposes the proud, and it is the proud and the arrogant that eventually become broken. Now to orient ourselves into the stories of 1st and 2nd Samuel, we should remember that in the story of the Bible, we are in the historical books of the Old Testament. And in our series, Jesus on Every Page, we are calling these set of books, No Perfect People Allowed. And we have seen that there are definitely no perfect people in the book of Joshua and in Judges. We see the Israel's unfaithfulness to God as their people and the leaders turn away from God and go to idols. However, even within this spiritual low point of Israel's history, there remain some stories of a faithful few, a remnant, if you will, of people who love God and want to obey him. We saw that with Ruth, and we continue to see these patterns of faithfulness and unfaithfulness, of humility versus pride throughout First and Second Samuel. And again, it is the humble, it is the faithful who shine like stars in the dark night of the unfaithful culture and world. So as 1 Samuel, the story continues, Hannah's son, who she just praised God for, she names him Samuel. And Samuel grows up in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. So much so that Samuel grows up to serve as an assistant to the high priest, Eli. And there's one night that Samuel and Eli are sleeping and Samuel hears someone call his name. And logically, Samuel thinks it's Eli. And so he runs over and wakes up Eli. He's like, Eli, hey, did you call me? I'm ready. What do you need from me? And Eli, I can just imagine, he's woken up by Samuel. He's like, hey, Clearly, I'm asleep. I did not call your name. Go back to bed. And now all the parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles might be a little too familiar with that situation of a little one going to wake them up in the middle of the night. But Samuel did not interrupt Eli's beauty sleep just once, not twice, but three times in one night. And finally, the third time, Eli realizes that there's something going on here. And he realizes that God is trying to speak to Samuel. 
So the third time, Eli instructs Samuel in chapter three, verse nine, go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And in doing that, in Samuel inviting the Lord to speak into his life, the Lord shows up in a monumental way. And the Lord gives Samuel a vision that one day he will raise up Samuel to eventually be the high priest and take Eli's place because of the wicked acts that Eli and his family have committed. And that's exactly what happens. And as Samuel rises to power in Israel, Samuel proves to be a great leader. And the key to his success, the reason that Samuel was a faithful leader was because he had a humble and not a prideful heart. We see that in the ways that Samuel called the people to repentance, called Israel to turn away from their idols and go back to worshiping their one true God. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 3, Samuel said to all the Israelites, if you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Samuel also faithfully fulfilled the duties of the priest to intercede for the people. In chapter 7, verse 9, Samuel took a suckling lamb and sacrificed it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. And finally, scripture itself declares Samuel to be one of Israel's faithful leaders. Chapter 7, verse 15 says, Samuel continued as Israel's leader all the days of his life. But unfortunately, not everyone's heart was as, humbles, was as humble as Samuel's. Samuel's sons, who start to take on priestly leadership in Samuel's old age, they start to stray away from God, and they turn the people away from him. And so Israel sees this. They, they see the wrong path that Samuel's sons are starting to lead them, and they don't like it, righteously so. But instead of looking to God for direction on what to do next, they start to look side to side. And they look at other nations, and they look at what they have, and they become jealous, and they desire a king. They don't want to be set apart as a different nation for God. They want to be like everyone else who has kings to lead them. And so they go to Samuel and they say, Samuel, ask God to give us a king. And Samuel goes, I don't think that this is God's plan for us. I don't think that a king is going to accomplish what you want the king to accomplish. That this king is going to be imperfect. This king will exploit you physically and economically. And he is going to abuse his power. And Samuel warns them. But still the people in chapter 8 verses 19 and 20, the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said. We want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. See, Israel wanted an earthly king that they could lay their eyes on, who they could look to, and they forgot that they already had the best king and the best leader they could ever have in their heavenly king and heavenly father. In these books of the Bible, these historical books, we learn a lot from this contrast of humble versus prideful leaders. See, in already what we've looked at in 1 Samuel, Samuel and Israel responded differently to their circumstances. You see, Samuel, when faced with a choice, he waited and invited the Lord to speak into his life. But Israel... Israel did not hesitate to ask for what they desired. Israel turned to the left and the right. They felt their discontent. They felt their jealousy, but they did not think to pause and reflect and ask God what they should do. Instead, they went straight to the Lord and said, give us what we want instead of asking God, what do you want for us? And one way we can learn from this, one way we can choose humility over pride is by making room in our lives to hear from the Holy Spirit. 
a little underlying theme of our Jesus on every page series for the last few weeks has been this talk about distractions. We are all distracted by our phones at every notification that pops up, at every buzz. We fill our ears with podcasts and music and TV shows, and we run from one thing to the next. And busy people are seen as important people, and therefore they are valued in this world. And not all of those things are bad, but they do become dangerous when we allow those things to drown out the sound of God's voice in our lives. And this is particularly convicting for followers of Christ because Jesus being fully man and fully God, Jesus wasn't distracted. Jesus didn't hurry. So church, why do we? In John chapter six, verse 38, Jesus said himself, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus was laser focused on accomplishing the father's mission. He was all about it. Despite what he felt, despite his thoughts, he wanted to be all about his father's mission. And the reason why he could do that, the reason why he, he didn't give in to distractions is because he made, a ha- he made a habit of regularly doing things like this. Mark chapter one, verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus regularly got time alone with the Father to pray with him. And so church, if Jesus intentionally and regularly withdrew from noise in order to listen for the Father's voice, then how much more should we? Here is our challenge for this week. Every day this week, start a prayer time with God that follows this template. First of all, thank God for who he is. Praise him for his goodness and his character. And then steal Samuel's prayer and pray 1 Samuel 3, 9. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Lord, me as your servant, I'm listening for your voice and your direction. And then practice five minutes of silence to listen for what the Lord puts on your heart. See, instead of jumping in with our own prayer requests, instead of, um, instead of um, putting the power in our own hands and saying, God, you need to listen to us. What if we put the power back into the hands that they rightfully belong in and say, Lord, the power is yours. I'm listening as your servant to what you would have for me and for this world. And some of you might be thinking, well, Claire, that sounds great, but you just don't know me. I'm just not about silence. I love noise. I can't sit still. Well, hey, silence is not necessarily for me either, but scripture is clear that silence is for followers of Christ. It's a discipline. And so here's a little tip that I learned from one of my mentors. As you are spending this time in silent prayer, as you are reading God's word, Keep your phone in a different room because we've talked a lot about how that can be a distraction, but keep a pad of sticky notes and a pen with you so that when you do have an intruding thought of something important that you need to do, you simply write it down, set it aside, and that way you continue on with your prayer. And so you don't forget the important things that you need to do, but you don't totally derail yourself from the time that you're spending with God. This is a really simple practice, but I think it can help us choose humility over pride. St. Vincent de Paul once said, he who hurries delays the things of God. And I worry that so much of us in our pride of thinking that people are relying on us, that I, that I have so much to do, I have so much to accomplish. Too many of us are not slowing down long enough to hear God's voice in the way that Samuel did. And instead we are hurrying through life just like the Israelites and in doing so we delay or even disobey the things of God. And over time that will determine whether we only have earthly success in this world, or if we have the best success that you and I could ever imagine, and that success means being in God's presence now and eventually with him forever in God's kingdom. 
and for Israel in God's grace, even as they ask him for a king, he grants them their desire and he gives them a king. But because in asking for a king, Israel was actually rejecting God's leadership and authority over their lives, their earthly king would be imperfect and would not fulfill all the desires and hopes that they have. And that's exactly what happens with Saul, Israel's first king. Saul starts off so strong with the Lord, but eventually he disobeys. Eventually he strays away and it creates a need for a new king of Israel. And so the Lord takes Samuel on this journey of finding the next king. And Samuel is looking for someone who's tall, someone who's strong, someone who has it all together, who looks the part. But God warns Samuel in chapter 16, verse 7, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And that is when we meet David, who eventually becomes Israel's next king after Saul and and over time becomes known as Israel's most important king and actually as a role model. And the reason for his success is not because he looked the part, is not because he had all of these um, accomplishments according to the world standards. The reason that he is seen as Israel's most important king is because he had a humble heart that was after God's own heart. And once again, we see that theme of the Lord opposing the proud, but lifting up the humble. But even for David, who becomes one of the most humble kings of Israel, who becomes their standard, even David, as we will see in 2 Samuel with Pastor Jason, he is not a perfect leader either. And so as we read these books, and we see all of these imperfect leaders and imperfect people, one of the biggest takeaways and the most encouraging is that God, Jesus, is our true king. And that is really good news because God alone is perfect and God alone is sovereign. That means he's perfectly in control. That means he stays on his throne of heaven and on earth and he is not shaken by any of our unfaithfulness. And the extra good news is that God doesn't just hold all the power in heaven and on earth. He can be trusted with that power because he alone is holy. God alone balances perfectly absolute power with a perfect heart of humility and holiness. And that is why the kingdom of heaven belongs to him. Remember Hannah's prayer. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. And so when we're struggling today to trust that God is in control, that he is good, that he is our one true king who knows best, we can reflect and remember on the way that God has revealed his faithfulness in the past. God made Hannah able to have a son. God raised up leaders and even kings for Israel and used them to work out his story even when they disobeyed and rejected him. For followers of Christ today, Jesus and the Holy Spirit has saved us and he continues to save us and transform us by looking more and more like Jesus as we look to him every day. God alone is holy. There is no one like him. And that is why we can trust God as our one true king. Now, would you join me in welcoming up Pastor Jason to walk us through 2 Samuel. Thank you, Pastor Claire, for that amazing message, but then also just for setting us up so well for going into the book of 2 Samuel and looking at how Jesus is our eternal one. If you have your Bibles with me, if you're at home, pull out your Bibles, open up 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 to 16. But while you're getting there, I would love to just do an overview of the book of 2 Samuel. As we heard in Pastor Claire's uh, message, we heard of 1 Samuel— in 1 Samuel, how the Israelites wanted a king. They were looking to their left, they were looking to their right, and they were looking at the the world around them and wanting a king as well. And by God's grace and by his mercy, he did give them one. He gave them the king Saul, who eventually was not so great of a king. But in the midst of his rule, God uh, chose out David, a young man, 
who built such a great, strong military presence in the eyes of the Israelites. He started to be looked upon as great and amazing. But in the midst of this, Saul eventually saw David. He got jealous and he chased after David, tried to kill him, tried to murder him, and he wronged him time and time and time and time again. And this jealousy of David eventually, he would uh, uh, fear that David would take over the throne that he was sitting in. And now, as we go into 2 Samuel, we see that Saul and his son Jonathan were dead. And David, when he sees this, what was his response? He was being chased after Saul so many times. You would think that he would be throwing a party. He would be having people there excited. You think he'd be living his best life. But no, what we see in 2 Samuel chapter 1 verse 23 tells us a different story. It says, Saul and Jonathan, in life they were loved and admired, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. What do we see here? We see David's heart of grace and forgiveness. That as he was being chased to be killed, that he chose to forgive Saul and Jonathan. That, that God eventually saved him from that place. And now this leads me to the question where we have to ask ourselves is who may you need to forgive today? I don't know who it is in your life. Maybe they have wronged you in some way, or maybe you think they have wronged you, and you've been holding a grudge uh, against them for so, so long in your life. Maybe they haven't chased after you and been trying to kill you as Saul was with David, but maybe you have holding hatred in your heart for them. And how, may we take after David's posture of forgiveness and grace. So who is that person? Now, as we see David's character in this, we see that he had the character of a truly godly king. So the question we ask is, why didn't God give Israel David before Saul? Well, I actually believe that the reason Saul became before David was so Israel can see that it wasn't just about having a king to rule over them. It was about having a king, a leader that would point them to Yahweh, point them to God at the end of the day. Don't we need that more in our church here today? Everywhere to point each other to Christ. And as we see throughout the book of 2 Samuel, we see David uh, fighting with the house of Saul, eventually taking the, uh, the reign of Israel. And he is taking in a broken and divided nation. But by the power and the work of God in his life, that that nation became unified, became powerful, and started to drive out other nations to where God has called them to be. But... What was most amazing about David's reign? It wasn't the, the, these military wins, but it was as Pastor Claire said, it was his humility. And ultimately, he wasn't teaching the Israelites to look to him. He was teaching them to look to God. That God was the place of worship. He is Yahweh, the one who would to be worshiped at the end of the day, to look towards God's leadership and guidance in their life. And through this, we see that they receive what God has promised. So hopefully you're at 2 Samuel chapter uh, 7, uh, verses 8 to 16. If you want to read along with me, it'll say this. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I've cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul whom I removed from before you. 
Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now, what is being said here? What we see is that Nathan is having a prophecy, uh, is prophesying to God, to, to, to David at this time. This is the divinic covenant that we see. It is ultimately uh, God's promises to David. And so what does that mean? I want to help you break it down here. We see that God is making uh, promises to Israel, but he's also making promises to David. But I want us to focus on the promises to David here. Here we see the divinic covenant and how this is God's promises to David at the end of the day. One, we see that David's name will be made great on earth. I mean, think about it today, 2023. I'm sitting here talking about David, how humble he was and how he was a man after God's own heart. His name is still great today on this earth. Number two, his descendants will build, his descendant will build the house of God. Number three, God claims David's descendant as his son. For a descendant of David will have an everlasting kingdom, a kingdom that will never end. And lastly, David's house will at the end endure forever. That God will bring someone up from his line and his blood. That God will initially place someone who their kingdom will never end. And his descendant will be a son of the father. How beautiful this promise to David now, how was David's response to this? If we look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 27 to 29, it'll show us. This is a prayer that David is led to after he hears this promise from God. It says, Lord Almighty, God of Israel, you have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build a house for you. So your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. Sovereign Lord, you are God. Your covenant is trustworthy, and you have promised these good things to your servant. Now be pleased to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever in your sight. For you, sovereign Lord, have spoken. And with your blessing, the house of your servant will be blessed forever. The covenant that God made with David led him to courage. It led him to prayer. It led him to worship and praise of the one and only God, Yahweh. And at the end of this, we see that David wanted to build the house of the Lord, the temple. At this time, the Israelites were worshiping in a tent. And God, and David, and David eventually, in right motives, wanted to build an established place of worship. But God told him no very early on in his reign. And you can imagine that this may have been something that's against his wants, against his desires, exactly what he had planned out for his reign. And so when we look at this, the question we need to ask is, who is the offspring that God is promising here? Well, we see near the end of David's reign when he dies, his son Solomon takes the reign. And when he takes the reign, what he does is building off of his father's shoulders, David left uh, 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 things for Solomon to build the temple. And Solomon, at the end of the day, builds the house of the Lord. And God never leaves his side. And so I want us to think about this, of how God's plan is more trustworthy than the desires and wants we have for our lives. I want to say that again. God's plan is more trustworthy than the desires and the wants we have for our lives. What wants and desires are you putting before the plan that God has in your life? Maybe it is a promotion you have been working for for years and years. Maybe it is a job you've been applying for, but you've been continuously been just denied, denied, denied. Maybe it is a relationship that you are wanting or fantasizing about or that you want to have one day, and you keep working at it, but you, you just can't seem to get it. What are those wants and desires that you are constantly chasing after? What if God says no to them? Are you willing to say no as well? Are you willing to say no to the ones and the things that you want to plan for your life in order to allow for the room of the Lord Almighty to establish what he has for you? See, if David chose to dwell on where God said no, he would have missed out what was right in front of him, what God had planned for him, that he had a broken and divided nation that God needed a leader to lead to point towards him. If he was so focused on building the temple, he would have missed out on what God is currently calling him to. My God, he works on the outside of the confines of time, but I know I sure don't. I know that I can't 
control the future, change it, or see it. And I know I have wants, I know I have desires, even if my motives are good, it, it doesn't matter at the end of the day because it's not in God's will, it should, it should not come into flourishing. But something we need to understand is that in the present of where we are is where we can feel the presence of God. We don't know where God is going to move in the future, but we, what we do know is that he's a trustworthy God that we can lay everything onto. We are to trust God because he is completely in control. But the good news is, is that this covenant doesn't end with Solomon. Rather, it is completely fulfilled by the works of Jesus Christ. If we turn to Luke chapter 1, verse 31 to 33, it says this. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. This is an angel of the Lord talking to Mary at this time. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. Remember in the covenant, he will be my son. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, someone of his offspring, right? And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So we get to the point of how Jesus is the complete fulfillment of the Davidic covenant and establishes the new covenant covenant. Jesus is the son of the father, and he comes from the offspring of David, and his reign will reign forever. Why will his reign reign forever? Although he died on a cross about 2,000 years ago, he still rose from the grave three days later, and for that, his kingdom is established forever. That is good news, but because of this, he has fulfilled that promise that God gave to David. But in this, in the fulfillment of that, he then establishes a new promise to us. Luke chapter 22, verse 19 to 20, it says this. This is Jesus in the Last Supper with his disciples before he was arrested and killed. It says, and he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. That in our sinfulness, that we have separated ourselves from God. That our God is a holy and righteous God that cannot be in the midst of sin or be in communion with sin. And for that, we have been separated from him. But because our God is abundant in love and patient, he didn't just smite us there, but rather what he did was he sent his one and only son to live onto this earth, to walk the life we couldn't, to live that perfect life, and to later to be falsely accused and sent to, sentenced to death. He carried his cross and he hung on that cross and took on the punishment that was supposed to be poured upon us, upon himself. And when he died, he was buried, but it does not end there. He rose again three Three days later to ascend to the right hand of the Father to establish his kingdom forever. And now the covenant that is made for us is that those who believe and who those who believe and repent of their sins turn away from their old ways and turn to God and profess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord will be saved and be entered into eternity. This is the covenant that is now given to us. As he fulfilled the old one, he establishes this one, that those who believe in the Son and his resurrection will live in eternity with God. For this, he is now the eternal king that will reign forever. His dominion is eternal. He is great. He is holy. He is, his power is mighty. His promise is trustworthy, and he is worthy of all worship and all praise. No longer do we work to look towards earthly kings, but we look towards our eternal one, our eternal king. But now we set our eyes, our gaze upon the great high priest, the king of kings and the lord of lords, and now because he is our eternal king. This is the good news, the new covenant that is now placed upon us. But now what do we do with this? What does this mean for us? Pastor Claire brought up a prayer challenge. I want to add upon this prayer challenge. She says here, every day this week, start a prayer time with God that follows this template. Thank God for who he is. Pray chapter 1, Samuel 3, verse 9, or 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 9. Practice five minutes of silence. That's hard for me too, trust me. But I want to add on two more. The fourth one is pray your own requests to God. Openly bring a petition to God asking him for whatever it is that necessarily that you need in your life. It's not promise, but we are bringing these things to God. And at the end of it, 
close your prayer with asking God's will to be done and his kingdom to go- come. We can look at David's trust in the Lord that as he steps into his reign and his wants and desires were pushed to the side, but rather the plan that God had for their life, we can look to that and pray this prayer asking for God's will to become, to come. That when he didn't throw a fit and neither should we, rather he turned to God with praise. Why? Take a look at this prayer in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 31 to 32. At the end of David's reign, he says, as for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? David knew he can trust in God, completely put control into him. Why? Because he knew that his name will reign forever, that he is perfect and his ways are righteous that he may not live to see the fulfillment of all the things that God promised, but he trusts in his Lord Almighty. Which leads me to my big idea, which is this. When we submit to God's will and put trust in his plan, we will find peace even in the darkest of times. When we submit to God's will and put trust in his plan, we will find peace even in the darkest of times. Do you trust in your king? Do you trust in him when, even when everything is, seems to be going sideways and the world is against you? See, our God is a God of complete control and sovereignty over the past, the present, and the future. Do you trust in him? And do you trust in his plan? Maybe you had a diagnosis of cancer maybe a couple months ago. Maybe even you lost a loved one, maybe a a, a son, a daughter, an aunt, an uncle. Maybe you've been fighting with depression for years upon years, and it seems like there's no way out. There's only darkness, and this is all meaningless, and it means nothing. But what if I told you that even in the midst of all of that, God is still working? that we may not see it, but God is working a plan that we need to trust in. That as Christians, we walk in faith. We trust in the unseen, not in the seen. We trust in the eternity of Christ and understanding that when we are overwhelmed with the craziness and the darkness of the world and bad things tend to happen, we lose loved ones or things just seem, seem to go against our way, that we can look to the cross in complete confidence that our God has already won. That our God is in complete control over everything and his plan has already been completed. And that we can trust that when things are bad, when we suffer with depression and anxiety and so many things, that God at the end of the day is working all things to the glory of him. We can look to the new covenant and worship God in the midst of the hardest times of our lives. In the midst of trials, trusting he is working out a glory that we may not even see and may never see until the other side of eternity. That we can look forward knowing that eternity awaits and all things work to the glory of God. Bow your head with me as we go into a time of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. God, we thank you that we get to open your words, get to read from the Old Testament of 1st and 2nd Samuel, get to learn how we get to approach you with humility and put our pride to the side and really look towards you and see how you exalt the humble. But God, we also thank you that it's not that we're doing this blindly, but we know we have a God who is completely in control that he is sovereign over the past, the present, and the future, that when things go bad in our lives, that we can lean on you, knowing that the cross is a symbol of your complete work of deliverance for us, and that the covenant that God, that Jesus fulfilled and has established with us brings us hope, even when we tend to suffer. And God, we thank you for today, and I pray, Father, that you, you, you work through us and show us your plan and your will for our lives. And we say this all in your son's name. Amen.